What are you guys doing here? Uh, waiting to go to Starbucks to the second Y. I've been having auto break-ins in this parking lot every morning around this time. Yeah, I just got... And so... Breakfast. Okay. Well, that's... Good morning, guys. Driving all night. Okay. Takes eight hours to get here. Well, relax. That's my reason why I'm talking to you. Okay, so wait a minute. Now, why did you ask me for my ID? You just explained to me about the break-in. Right. But well, why did you explain to me about the, uh, my ID? What's that about? This encounter occurred in 2019 between Alameda County Sheriff deputies, 72-year-old mother Asieli Lagervale, and her two daughters, Adi Lagervale, 17, and Asieli Haddage Lagervale, 19, in Castro Valley, California. At first, the family is grateful for the warning that there have been frequent thefts in the area, but the interaction quickly sours when the deputy inquires if the mother is legally able to park in a disabled spot despite the very visible placard on her rearview mirror. Then, she's demanded to produce her identification, which she refuses. Attorney Craig Peters, who represented the family, said that the mother was absolutely right that she did not need to provide her ID to Deputy Stephen Holland. They can ask. They can always ask, but you don't have to give it to them. And they can only demand it if they have reasonable suspicion to believe that you've committed a crime. Attorney Peters said that this was only the first time that the deputies violated the Lagervale family's constitutional rights. Apparently, Deputy Holland believed the fact that the three women had been sitting in the car for a while and that the mother may have dozed off for a few seconds was suspicious. But as Osley said, she'd been driving all night from Nevada, an eight-hour trip, and was just taking a break before going into the Starbucks to get a cup of coffee. Moreover, one of the daughters was apparently about to get dropped off for a math test in Berkeley and may have needed some caffeine to energize herself for that. Nevertheless, Holland continues to demand for Osley's identification and the situation only escalates as Osley continues to refuse. She even calls the police on the deputies at one point and Deputy Holland informs them that they're all being detained. He won't even let one of the daughters go inside to use the restroom. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Call 911. Call 911. What, what, what is going on here? I'm gonna call the police. I'm gonna call the police. I'm gonna call okay. The police. No, no, we're not. We're not doing that. Okay, everyone in this car is detained. You can go back in the car and wait, or or you can go in handcuffs and go in my car. Obviously, no one in the car reacts positively to the deputy's threat to put them in handcuffs if they do not cooperate, and he follows through with that threat after both of the daughters are out of the car, and he tries to yank Osley from the driver's seat. Get out of the car. I'll get out. Just don't put on me. I'll get out. All right, get out of the car. 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 This is your last chance to get out of the car or I'll place it. Or I'm placing you under arrest. Get out of the car. Get out of the car. You're being the thing. Put your hand behind your back or you're going to go to jail. No, I'm not going to after handcuffing all three of the women, they're put into the backseat of squad cars, and they continually claim that they have not committed any crimes. On more than one occasion, they're scolded for making demands of the police and for resisting arrest. We haven't done anything, so did this I asked for, I don't have a weapon on me. I'm just I asked checking. for his superior, his supervisor. I asked for a supervisor. Grab a seat. It's not, it's not how things work, man. No, what are you talking about? This out? We haven't did anything. Your feet. You don't, we haven't you don't demand what we do. No, I, I'm not demanding anything. Then, Deputy Holland goes back to the rental car and tries to find Osley's ID in her purse. Her daughters continue to engage with the cops, and at one point, an officer seems to push one of them into the squad car. She insists that he's hurting her. Holland goes back over to the car Osley is in and he asks her where her ID was because apparently he couldn't find it. I need to identify who you are and your relationship to this car and to the people. So, where's your driver's license at? It's in my wallet. Okay, which one's that? It's my black wallet. The black wallet? Is that in the purse that was right by your feet? Yes, it is. Okay. From there, it seems as though Deputy Holland mutes his body cam while he consults the other officers. The policies on such an act vary from department to department, but in Sacramento, which is about an hour and a half away from where this incident occurred, officers are instructed not to deactivate or mute their BWCs, body-worn cameras, until the investigative or enforcement activity involving a member of the public has concluded. Well, 
I'm going out and well, like, talk to my partners. Farrah, what is going on? <laughs> this rule came after the highly criticized actions of officers muting their cameras right after the shooting of a 22-year-old man named Stephen Clark, who was black just like the women involved in this incident, in his grandmother's backyard. However, the Alameda County does not have these stringent mandates. Instead, officers there have much more discretion. In fact, the order regarding body-worn cameras state that officers can deactivate their cameras during any incident that the member determines where the body-worn camera must be deactivated, either temporarily or for the entire event, based on articulable reasons, i.e. sensitive intelligence gatherings such as meeting with informants when discussing sensitive tactical or confidential law enforcement information or other investigative purposes. The order further lays out that officers must first indicate, while still in recording mode, the reasoning for the deactivation. And Holland did that when he said, I'm going out to talk with my partners. The sound on Holland's camera does not resume, but footage shows him and other deputies going through the car and the Lagervale family's belongings. They were held for about 70 minutes before being let go. The three women were not issued charges. The search was yet another violation of their constitutional rights, because under the Fourth Amendment, citizens have the right to be free from unreasonable searches if an officer can't articulate that a person has committed a crime. Which, of course, neither Deputy Holland nor his associates could do, as parking in a Starbucks parking lot, even for a prolonged amount of time, without extenuating circumstances, is not indicative of a crime. Unless, of course, there were reports of trespassing or soliciting, but it's clear that there wasn't in this case. It's interesting to note that the initial call or report of the break-ins said that it was either two black men who were involved, or one black man and another Latino man. Nothing indicated that females, albeit black females, were involved at any time. The Lagervales filed a civil suit against the deputies and the county. They alleged the deputies committed false arrest, invasion of privacy, negligence, and violations of the 1st, 4th, and 14th Amendments, and a two-day trial was held before U.S. District Court Judge William Alsup in San Francisco. During those proceedings, the deputies testified that they were in the right because they were investigating car burglaries. The officers would have been well served to sort of take a good hard look at what had happened and just acknowledge some of it, Attorney Peters opined. But instead, they kind of doubled down on trying to shade facts to try and make this situation seem not as bad as it was. Try to raise some doubt, you know, attacking the women. The jury had none of what the officers were selling or trying to sell. And on March 1st, they found that the Lagervale family was owed a total of $8.25 million in damages. Specifically, Deputy Holland was found liable for $2.7 million to the mother and $2 million to each of her daughters. And Deputy Monica Pope, the blonde woman in the video, was found liable for $750,000 to both daughters. The jury also found that Alameda County was liable for the officer's actions. Admittedly, $8.25 million is a lot, especially in a case that did not allege the use of excessive force. To compare, in the Stephen Clark case, which involved the fatal shooting of an unarmed citizen, his family was only awarded $1.7 million. Judge Alsup actually has the discretion to lower the award, but the attorneys representing Alameda County would need to file a request and convince him to do so first. As of the posting of this video, nothing has been filed to indicate that the county is going to do that. As already hinted at, many speculate that race was definitely a factor in the events that transpired outside of that California Starbucks. Federal jury agreed, deliberating for two days and returning an $8.25 million verdict. The Lagervale's lawyer says the sheriff's office did an internal affairs investigation that said the two deputies did nothing wrong, and both have since been promoted. And local media has reported that this high amount likely signals that the jury felt the family had been stripped of their constitutional rights because of the color of their skin. However, none of this has affected Holland's or Pope's careers. On the contrary, they've both since been promoted to sergeant and an internal investigation found that they did nothing wrong. 
Interestingly enough, an analysis of excessive force and wrongful death police payouts from 2015 to 2020, which was obtained by local media, revealed that Alameda County had the most payouts than any other enforcement agency in the Bay Area during that time period. The two agencies before Alameda County were $5.5 million and $5 million respectively and stemmed from the death of a 20-year-old man. Attorney Peters said, I think what makes me upset is that the Alameda County Sheriff's Office didn't take the initiative to correct what to me seems like such an easy thing to have corrected early on, and instead, they wanted to sweep it under the rug. He also said that no one in the Sheriff's Office has said, we need to fix this. Let's talk to this family, apologize, say, hey, we were wrong, we're working on this, do some restraining. That would have been the responsible thing to do. Unlike these officers, the lives of the Lagervales have forever been altered after this event. They worked hard, Attorney Peters commented, and then this happens and it just shakes your foundation about the place you live in. I hope that they can recover that at some point, but I suspect that they won't. He also added this. To some extent, for the rest of their life, every time they see police officers, every time they're in a Starbucks parking lot, there's, they're, they're going to remember this. As for Asieli Haddage Lagervale, she made it to her math test, but she was over 40 minutes late. Nevertheless, she is set to graduate from UCLA later this year. Going forward, it'll be interesting to see what amount of money is actually given to the family as compensation for the poor treatment they received. And a lot of commenters on the video, which was released by KTVU Fox 2 San Francisco on March 6, 2023, are outraged by the actions of the police involved. One said, This is beyond disturbing. These thugs go around making crap up and do whatever they want to people and get promotions and raises and the victims are left having to try and continue life among these same scumbags. Hopefully they sued and got a huge settlement in their favor. I'm so tired of seeing these types of situations unfold on body cam and zero accountability and qualified immunity. Qualified immunity in the United States protects a government official from lawsuits alleging that the official violated a plaintiff's rights, and only allowing suits where officials violated a clearly established statutory or constitutional right. When determining whether a right was clearly established, courts consider whether a hypothetical reasonable official would have known that the defendant's conduct violated the plaintiff's rights. Courts conducting this analysis apply the law that was in force at the time of the alleged violation, not the law in effect when the court considers the case. And according to the 2009 Supreme Court case Pearson v. Callahan, qualified immunity balances two important interests, the need to hold public officials accountable when they exercise power irresponsibly and the need to shield officials from harassment, distraction, and liability when they perform their duties reasonably. Another comment critiqued others who likely voiced support for the deputies and said, Seems like most people here got it, but a few didn't, so read here. Officers may only detain and or demand ID from an individual only if they have a reasonable and articulable suspicion that they're in the process of committing a crime, have already committed a crime, or are about to commit a crime, or infraction. Sleeping in the car by itself is not reasonable suspicion. Maybe sleeping in the car with burglary tools in plain sight, window punch, pry bar, etc. could fall under reasonable suspicion. Or if the lady rolls her windows down and smells like alcohol or is slurring her speech, the officers were in the wrong here. Hopefully this case, and many others that we've covered on this channel, will further inspire police reform, especially when it comes to the unfair treatment of people of color.